Today on the In All Kinds of Weather forecast, we welcome former Gator radio announcer and double Gator grad, Mike Gillespie, to the In All Kinds of Weather team. We recap the Gators' orange and blue spring game. We also take a couple minutes to catch up on the recent developments with Gator basketball and Gator stickball. This is the In All Kinds of Weather forecast. And welcome to the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. My name is Mike Gillespie. Thrilled to be a part of the brand. Reminder to like and subscribe. I know you probably hear it a thousand times a day on a thousand different YouTube pages, but please like and subscribe. That's obviously how we make our money here. So please do that for us. Give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts as well. Go follow IAKOW brand on social media. That's at all kinds of weather on Twitter and at all kinds of weather blog on Instagram. Also follow the show on Twitter, I A K O W forecast, and follow yours truly, Mike A. Gillespie, on Twitter as well. I'm also on Facebook. I'm also on InstaFace, if that's a thing, uh, Snapchat, uh, everything. Uh, yeah, so go follow me there. Insta uh, face. Super InstaFace. Uh, yeah, didn't Bill Belichick say, say that one time? I'm pretty Did sure. He? I think he was like, oh, I don't know, like the in Insta face or something. I like purposely that. don't watch his press conferences for that very reason. But... <laughs> yeah, they're they're not super thrilling, but every once in a while, like he threw in just some random stuff that would make me really, really chuckle. Um, but uh, yeah, super, super, super excited to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, Neil, thanks so much for having me, man. Yeah, glad to glad to have you on. Um, I mean, Chris Yanes, our our host, is is still you know working on some things in his personal life. He'll be back. Um, I do imagine a scenario where the, the three of us can get together and, and divvy up the Gator talk. For those of you wondering about that, but yeah, this is not a permanent replacement. Chris will be back. This is in addition to the in all kinds of other team and a very good one at that. Mike, I mean, obviously, is very. He's very talented. He's very well, I would say, traveled. He's very well um, experienced. So, yeah, I mean, before we get into the spring game, Mike, just give the Gator listeners um, and, and viewers a little bit about yourself. Why are you um, now back in the world of talking Gator sports after you were known for your Gamecock and Clemson Tiger talk the last decade? And uh, yeah. yeah, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, uh, no. So I was here for the last 10 years. I'm in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. So uh, my gig at Wolo TV, ABC Columbia was basically covering South Carolina, Clemson, uh, some Charlotte stuff here and there, Charleston, really all across the state. We covered the Masters every year. Uh, super, super fun gig. Um, like all jobs, that one had to come to an end at some point. Uh, so I found myself out of work about a month ago and uh neil i've you know you and i have followed each other for a long time and you know i've always appreciated the stuff that you put out and uh just felt like it would be a really really good fit um i'm a, a two-time florida grad i'm from gainesville originally uh yeah grew up there couldn't be more of a florida fan um uh, which is good and bad, as you know, um, sometimes, you know, it's it's tough to see things uh, for how they actually are when you're so much of a fan. But I've tried to remove that uh, over the last, you know, 10 years of being in in reporting. Uh, hopefully I have, but I'm still, a, you know, kind of a super Gator at heart, man. And uh, yeah, I, I was with the Gator Sports Network, Radio Network, did softball, uh, lacrosse. Uh, and soccer. And if you've never listened to lacrosse on the radio, don't, um, because it's not that fun. Um, but yeah, anyway, man, I, I, you know, you drove up, uh, what last week we had some stay, you, you made the almost two hour drive from Charleston to Columbia just to meet with us. And, um, it was freaking awesome. Uh, so I couldn't be happier to do this, uh, even if it's just in the interim. I don't I don't want to give myself that much credit. It's only an hour 20 from Charleston from, from where I am in Charleston. I'm sure. I'm a little north of Charleston, um, like by the Air Force Base. So Ladson to where you are is about an hour 20. But yeah, I mean, it was it was a it was a great fit. Um, I mean, you're you, your wife made a great dinner. You made great steaks. I can't uh I I can't take that and not do something for you in return. So um yeah, but I mean, like over the last 
24, 36, 48 ish hours. I mean, the idea really came like, you know, Mike is super talented at what he does. Mike obviously knows the Gators. Well, he, he follows the Gators. Well, even though he he's been working in Gamecock territory for the past decade. And, and you and I can probably share our, our, our opinions on, uh, on, on some things about South Carolina that we, uh, Maybe we'll save it for another pod, but I mean, long story short, there's a lot of talent here. There's a lot of uh, value that you could bring to the all kinds of other brand. And that's why you're here. And, and let's, let's do that. Let's start getting some value out of you, Mike, right yeah. away. Gators Sounds had a spring game this yeah. past weekend. Um, I mean, well, you're, you're the host. I don't want to take anything oh. away from you. So I'll let you take the conversation back, but yeah, mm-hmm. let's, talk, let's talk Gators excited for that. Yeah. If you're a fan of uh, offense, uh, Saturday was not really for you. So uh, I don't know how long Spurrier lasted. Was he there? Was Steve there? Did they show him? I didn't see him. So I, I was there in the stadium. My my battery was kind of acting up on my phone. So I had limited um, yeah. service, to, like check Twitter and see. But I didn't see him, but I, I don't know. He might have been. Yeah. So if you're Spurrier, you probably didn't love it. Uh, 1917 blue beats orange uh not a whole lot of uh uh downfield completions uh let's say a lot of checkdowns which you know it was what we kind of saw last year with Graham Mertz and that was okay um he obviously finished with the what second highest completion percentage in the country so they're doing something right there. Uh, you had to love DJ Lagway, obviously. Uh, his number is 173 with two touchdowns. That's pretty impressive. He was running for his life at times uh, with that second team offensive line. So that might be a little concerning. Um, but yeah, overall, I'm mean, Blue Beats Orange 1917. Um, you know, honestly, Neil, I-, I thought the defense played really, really well. Uh, I did not love what the well I loved and didn't love what special teams did. You know, you can look at it two ways. Um, you know, if Florida's main kicker gets hurt, uh, they're in a world of hurt. Uh, we can get on uh, touch on that in a little while, but you know, it was definitely an interesting day. It, it, I I still am a firm believer that you won't see, and I've I've held this belief you know since I got into this business you know 15, 20 years ago. You really don't take that much away from a spring game right at the end of the day it's still a practice you know you're they're not you know they're not letting them go all out you know in the spring game though i did think it was cool that napier allowed you know the defense to rush sometimes you don't see that in spring games i thought that was kind of cool uh but all in all there's not a whole lot you can take away from the spring game but there you know there are bits and pieces that you can point to to say yeah that was good and yeah that was that was kind of bad yeah, I mean the the allowing the defense to rush to me is kind of like fool's gold. You still don't really know how a quarterback is going to do with the defense coming in and being allowed to actually apply some heavy contact. Like DJ Lagway, especially talking about him, um, Mertz. I mean, we've seen him in the offense before, so I mean, he has taken hits. He got injured as a result of a hit last year and literally cost him the rest of his season, um, or the last game in a quarter or so. But Still, like DJ Lagway has never actually gotten plastered by a fellow SEC football player. We don't know how he's going to react to that. We don't know how he's going to react on the next play. We don't know how he's going to react on that play when he knows that the boom boom is imminent, I guess. Like, you know, you're going to get level. You got to step up in the pocket and just deliver a great throw or choose to take off because you don't think you're going to be able to get the throw off while the defensive lineman or linebacker is coming in to kill you. Like you got to make that decision. We're not going to see that until it happens in game. So a lot of those stats, I think a lot of the, the game tape even is inflated because we don't, we don't have that psychological piece of data in our back pocket. What I will say is when Lagway is given a good pocket, we saw a beautiful ball to Taylor Spirito yeah. down the sideline. Um, we saw a nice throw to Aiden Mizell. I think that was kind of, bad defense more than it was a nice route. I mean, my did a good job. I think of putting his foot down on the ground and just slamming off it and exploding for a nice post route, but defense kind of gave him room. So I, I don't know how much to make of that, but my is another one where I look at and go, okay, that's one, like that's a clear winner of spring. Like that yeah. is a clear victor of Gator spring practice where we've heard stuff about him, you know, maybe not getting his body right last year. We've heard about the speed, but he just didn't have the muscle mass on him to produce on the field. 
maybe next year, maybe 2024 is going to be the year where he adds that muscle mass and he becomes a part of the Gator offense. We heard about that happening in spring. We saw it play out in the spring game. So that's really what more what I'm looking for to see guys who we're hearing about in the off season, or we're hearing about who we will want to hear about, like say in December and January, we're looking forward to seeing X, Y, Z produce in the spring, looking forward to them showing up in the spring. And we got that from my We got that from Lagway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was going to say, you got to love what the quarterbacks were able to do. Both Graham Mertz and DJ Lagway, uh, you know, had some pretty balls, as uh, Spurrier would say. Uh, but again, it, with DJ, he just didn't have that much time to throw, which is obviously a concern. I uh, want to talk uh, player of the game. Uh, Neil, we'll start with you. Um, you know, who did you love on Saturday? I mean, hard not to say Lagway. Again, with the caveat I just mentioned, um, yeah. hard not to say Mizell. Um, I was going to say I I give a little golf clap to Manny Nunnery for his interception until we saw what went <laughs> down on social media on Tuesday night. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, like, but that would, would have been a good story. Like the guy mm -hmm. doesn't have a great year. He's kind of the scapegoat for right. the fourth and 17 against Missouri, enters, enters the, portal, the portal, comes back, right. has a big play in the spring game. Like that would have been great. There's not much value to that now, but right. – I mean, like that, like that's the kind of stuff I look for in spring games. Another one, um, Sharif Denson loved what I saw from him on the defensive side of the ball. Had a couple of breakups, I think, as well as well as a pick. Had a nice play where he kind of started in the middle of the field. I don't know if he was supposed to be a robber or what, but he started like right between the hash marks, kind of inched his way toward one of the sidelines, and then just took off and made the tackle after like a three or four yard gain. So I liked what I saw from him, um, and I liked what I saw from Smack. I mean, Trey Smack, the game winning yeah. field goal. You can't really say that there's the pressure on the line there that there was, say, in the Arkansas game where he missed that one. But still, like, there is a game that's played out. You're hot. You're sweaty. Everyone's like, i got to go to the showers or they want to go to the Florida Victorious yeah. event after, which, by the way, yeah. shout out Florida Victorious. That was awesome. Um, but, like, people want to go home, and now it's just a matter of does your team win or lose, steps on the field. It's close, but he does get it to go through the upright. So I give, I give Smack a lot of credit for that, too. I'll say uh, between – Denson and Mizell and Smack, I probably go Mizell, but you could go for me. You could go with any of those three. Yeah, my, you, my could, player, you could have a different opinion altogether. Yeah, but my, show, I, my my player of the game honestly was Eugene Wilson, and I know you know he half of his yards came on on one touchdown grab. I think it was sixty yards or something, but you know one hundred and twenty eight yards, one touchdown. I mean, this guy has obviously elevated his game uh, from last year to this year. Just you know, absolutely incredible. What you know, the the growth that we've we've seen from him from you know year one to year two, uh, and then Jordan Baugh too. You can see you know why Nick Saban went after him so hard. Um, you know, and, and he was pretty close to signing with Alabama, chose Florida, finishes with 12 carries, uh, 77 yards. Really, really liked what I saw out of him at the running back position. That's something that Florida is obviously going to need a lot of with, um, you know, he who will not be named going to Georgia. Uh, you know, the more more good backs you can have at Florida, the better. So uh, I like really what I saw out of Jaden Bach a lot. Um, so things that, uh, maybe you didn't like, uh, Neil, wh what did you not like at the swamp on Saturday? Uh, I, I mean, one of these years I'd like to be able to line up with 11 guys on special teams. <laughs> yeah. That'd I, don't, be nice. I don't, I don't think it's that unrealistic to ask for that in year three of a, of the yep. same guy on special teams. Yep. Uh, I will say to his credit, there was another instance where Florida was lining up for a kickoff with only 10 guys, but before, like as the guy was putting the ball on the tee, the other nine guys were lined up. I think it was Smack who was kicking off. The other nine guys are lined up. Before he even like steps back into his trot, I hear Chris Couch screaming at the eleventh guy, "Get on the field! Get on the field!" So, well, that's good. like he's trying. I I can respect that. It's not like he's just sitting there doing nothing. But yeah. on the other hand, this is year three. This this mm -hmm. is spring number three at least yeah. for Chris Couch. And yep. now you have a second off-field analyst in Joe Houston. Right. Who came from the New have... England Patriots, by the way, right. who Under... were known for their absolutely stellar special teams. Exactly. And you still have 10 guys lining up for an extra point. 
I, you can't excuse that anymore. No. And like Billy Napier said, you know, we're going to, we're going to put more emphasis on uh, the offensive line well, on the trenches. So he goes and after his uh, Darnell Stapleton, his, his co-offensive line coach leaves for the NFL he has an opportunity, like he's been given this opportunity to rectify it maybe or right. uh, fix it or change yeah. course or whatever and get an on-field special teams coach. Doesn't do it. Goes and gets Jonathan DeCoster, who I have reason to believe is a perfectly qualified offensive line coach. It's just, again, the question of do you need two of them at the expense of this unit and special teams that has been costing you games? So That has literally cost you games last correct. year against Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And it was the same thing. Oddly enough, you got Boardingham who what catches a first down there. Uh, you know, he gets down to hurry up, you know, they get the field goal unit on. It's you know, it, it's like it's the same thing there at the end of the game. And and I just I saw visions of that Arkansas game last year. And it's just like, you know, guys, if 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 you I feel the same way, Neil, like if you know something has been caught literally costing you games, why don't you do something to fix that? And I mean, Houston was a, a great addition, obviously, but the end of the day when we're still seeing the same things in a spring game in a spring game like that's not good at the 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 culmination of spring practices right where you've practiced all of these things and then that that's what we see in front of you know how many people forty four thousand people in the swamp on saturday give or take something like that you know i I just think they said like 48 but i don't really 48 yeah i I, I mean it It looked like 40 but it looked like 40 yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it wasn't what Ohio State had, but uh, you know, it's uh, we'll we'll get there one day. Yeah, I, I uh, so that was one of mine. I, I absolutely despise the fact that we're seeing the same things on special teams again. You know, ten guys on the field. I don't know how in the world that happens today in in twenty twenty four. And you know, man, like I was a student, you know, during the Urban Meyer era, and guess what? They never made those mistakes. Urban Meyer was so incredibly detailed. Some of the greats have been. I mean, you know, I, I Shane Beamer, who I absolutely, you know, love and covered at USC, right? He is a special teams coach, right? He makes sure, man, and, and they have won games on special teams. They have not lost games on special teams. They have won games because of special teams. And, you know, not to say that Beamer's had an incredible run at South Carolina, but I've watched a coach literally win games because of special teams. I saw Urban Meyer do it too. Notably that blocked kick, you know, in 2006 where the swamp went freaking crazy. Um, it it can happen. You can win and lose games on special teams. And, you know, I'm just, I'm so tired of it. I don't know what the answer is there, but, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like, you know, it, it, if we're talking about something so simple as 11 guys on the field, can't that get, fixed in a year right like what if if it's not one thing it's something else that's the problem too if it if it was this is going to sound like so derisive but it's it's honest as honest gets if it was just a counting issue yeah it would be it would be bad enough but you could say all right well we need to have a new mouth on the sideline to try to get everyone on the field appropriately, but it's not just that it's two guys with the same Jersey number going on the field. It's trying to field punts in your own end zone, like Jason Marshall against Vanderbilt. It's giving up a fake punt touchdown to South Carolina. You just mentioned fought a clobbered South Carolina in that game. They still had a a fake punt given up for a touchdown after Florida called a timeout, by the way, to wake themselves up. Yes. When we, when we went 38 to six, we had one field goal attempt blocked. We couldn't get the snap down. We couldn't get the hold down for another one. We had a third one badly missed and we gave up a 40 yard punt return to juice Wells and we won the game by 32 points. So clearly special teams is not everything, but Billy should have gotten the message in that game. Like, Hey, something's not right. We got to do something about it. The very next week, Marshall tries to catch the punt in his own end zone. Florida loses that game to Vanderbilt. Also a missed PAT in that game too. So that's right. That like, if that didn't spur something on to, to be fixed or changed, I don't know why or how we can ever expect it ever to. And if that sounds too doomsday, I, I guess I can I can revise that statement slightly. I will believe it when I see it. I think we're yeah. just doomed for bad special teams play until proven otherwise. Well, and, you know, here's the thing, too. For a guy who is credited with being so detail-oriented, right, Billy Napier, he's the guy who is the most organized coach that we've ever seen. And, you know, he's got a plan and, and you know what, 
the off off field stuff I think has been magical for the University of Florida. Like, and it's and it's stuff that's not his fault. I mean, you and I have talked sort of off the record about the things that I know that are. I mean, they're pretty much well known now about you know kicking the can down the road with facilities and some of the conversations that happened with Jeremy Foley and you know, but. At the you know at the end of the day though he's also supposed to have an incredible game plan for the actual game on field and when you see two number threes run on at the same time you're like okay that's just unacceptable how does this continue to happen and then you know ten guys you know uh, last Saturday uh, for the field goal I, I just you know I'm I'm starting to get a little tired of it as a Florida fan uh, I am because I think it's cost them games. And if they, you know, I mean, this sounds obvious, but if they don't get it together, you know, in the next five months here, then it's going to cost them games, certainly in September, October, and November. And that could be the difference between Billy keeping or losing his job. It sucks to say that, but like it, that's where we are. The record's the record. And Like I, I don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of of ourselves here. Like we're we are just talking about the spring it game, and it's spring game. but 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 the spring yeah. game issues that we're that we're talking about here has cost Florida games. It's the in same the past. thing. It's the same right? issue. And now we're wondering, like, okay, it cost us games in 2022. It yeah. cost us games in 2023. Right. It now it it happened again in the spring game. I wouldn't say it cost us, but. I mean, we did have other special teams issues too. Like, as you mentioned earlier, Hunter Smith, uh, the FAU kicker uh, transfer, yeah, didn't really do his job. Like, if, and a if shank you said, punt. right, that too, that set up the game winning drive at the end. So, if Jeremy Crawshaw, the punter, or Trace Mack, the kicker, goes down, oh, I don't feel so good about that. I don't either. Yeah, I, I don't either at all. Um, and I, I don't know how that's possible. Uh, now, look, they're kids, right? So, like, the older I get, the more I hate, I hate like going after, you know, kids who are like 20 years old. Right. But like, you know, if you're brought to the university of Florida to kick field goals and you can't make a field goal, why are you a kicker? <laughs> like, and I get it. It's the first time he's out there, but like, come on, man. Like you can't go. What, what did he go over? Was it over for three? He had a couple extra points, but he missed yeah, three field but goals. He missed three field goals and he, and he had punt. the shank punt. So and that's again, that's the stuff that we look at and we're like, okay, yes, it's a spring game, but these issues are not new. It's not exactly unrealistic or jumping the gun for us to think, well, that's a warning sign that might cost us some games in the fall. So certainly yeah. something to be concerned about, if not outright infuriated over. Yeah. I mean, any anywhere on that scale, it's fair. Yeah, fortunately, I'm a married man now and I love my wife to death. But when I was dating, right, it, when when the same issues kept coming up with my girlfriend, you know, that were red flags, right? You could, it just, the, the more it happened, the more you were like, you know what? This just, it, it's not working. It's, it's not going to change. And I'm almost starting to feel that way with Billy Napier's special teams, unfortunately. But, you know, all in all, uh, Blue wins 19 to 17. Um, you know, again, uh, I... I really liked what we saw from, you know, the the whole package. It's kind of what you wanted to see in a spring game. There was some offense, uh, you know, their defense did their job. And, um, you know, it wasn't at the end of the day, it wasn't absolutely uh, atrocious. I'd like to see a little bit more offense next year. That'd be nice because uh, uh, that's just that's just me. I'm a I'm a I grew up during the Spurrier era and then I uh, went to school during the urban era. So I like me some points. Uh, but you know, it's, uh, neither here nor there. So yeah, blue wins 19 to 17, uh, want to get into, uh, you know, a couple other things, obviously if, if you want to wrap up, uh, you know, the spring game, I don't know if you were done talking about the spring game, but, um, yeah, no, but, I mean, I think I hit everything. I just, uh, I, if anything, I'd give a shout out to LJ McCray. Saw some good things from him. Oh too. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. you know, good true freshman stepping up. I, I heard, I'd heard conflicting things about maybe how quickly he, he'd kind of grasp the sec level of competition, but pretty much everyone I talked to agreed that within a week or so of the spring game, he'd picked it up. He looked yeah. good. He looked like he was going to be able to contribute. He did that in the game. That's again what I'm looking for. Guys that we're hearing about in practice is stepping up and showing it out in the game. So had to shout him out. I think after that, I think I've covered pretty much, pretty much everything I had. Yeah, so you covered Jaden Baugh too. 
Yeah. And, and again, I, I really liked what we saw out of Jaden Baugh. Um, you know, you cannot, as we know in the SEC, you can't have enough running backs. Um, and, you know, the, the, him being able to to show out on Saturday uh, gives me some some more hope for uh, for that position after losing ETN. Uh, some tennis news. Uh, your boy, Ben Shelton, Gainesville's own. Bue Holtz, by the way. Uh, right. Yeah, went to my high school. Uh, wins in, in Houston. He is the number one player now in the ATP rankings. Uh, and he's a lefty. What? Which is kind of cool because that doesn't happen very often that you see a lefty be number one in the ATP rankings. Shelton's just so freakishly good. I mean, he like when I watched him play in college for Florida, I knew he was going to be a pro. I didn't know that he was going to be this good of a pro. He's yep. the number one ranked American. Like he is number one in the country right now. And he's top 15 in the world. Yep. So that's, that's a big deal. I mean, Gators um, don't really have that great of a men's tennis history, but if you have even the slightest semblance of an interest in the game of tennis, Check out Ben Shelton like this summer and fall. He will be a mainstay at the main yeah. events. And he and he loves his gators too. Like he'll he'll yeah. do a chomp every now and then. Well, he's a Gainesville uh, boy. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, of course. That that too. But I mean, he like he follows all the sports. Like he was at the swamp, I think, for two or three games last year. Um, he was at a few basketball games. So yeah, he's he's super easy to get behind and root for. So I mean, obviously, we talk about Florida being the everything school. We got to support our boy uh, Ben Shelton as he continues to tear it up in the tennis world. Yeah, and you know, I, I love the fire, man. I absolutely love the fire from him. And you know, opponents hate it, but you know what? Like, he reminds me a lot of Andy Roddick, and just the way he connects with fans, uh, the the fire, the feistiness, the 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 want to win, the competitiveness. Um, it's good for the game, man. I, I, you know, America needs a young kid. I'm going to call him a kid because that's what he is. Like, you know, they need a young star. And I think Ben Shelton, especially with the, you know, the hang up, like that's, that's him. And it's really cool that, you know, he's a product of, of the university of Florida. Cause, uh, you know, more eyeballs on, on the sport on Florida tennis is, is definitely a good thing. Um, you know, Gator baseball, Gator softball, losing series, uh, over the weekend, you know, again, it, uh, you know, for baseball, it comes down to, uh, to pitching and relief pitching, uh, pitching all over the board. You know, it's just, it's just not there. And I don't know when it's going to show up, Neil, but, um, it's getting a little late. Got to find it sooner rather than later. Um, I mean, I think for, for baseball, baseball is one that concerns me more. Softball, I think, will be fine. Missouri yep. is a top 15 team. Yep. Kendra Falby, Skyler Wallace, Corby Otis, uh, Jocelyn Erickson, I, I trust all of them. Ava Brown's a freshman. I trust her. I think she'll be a lot better um, in, in coming years. And she's gotten better throughout the course of this year. Yeah, so I'm I was going to say great really... freshman pitchers. Right. Sure. Yeah. And so I'm not really worried about softball as much. Baseball is the one that concerns me. Um, not even just because they were number two to start the year, but I kind of don't want to just waste the last year of Jack Haglione. So yeah. I think that Pierce Coppola could turn into something good, but he's not exactly being given a full season to do that as he only just first pitched this weekend. Um, yeah. Gators got to get another starter. I mean, Caglione was great as a pitcher until the last two weekends. He's had two not great outings in a row, but I still take the entire sample size and say, okay, by and large, he's done a lot more good than bad. You still need at least one, preferably two more starting pitchers to go into a regional because Florida, I mean, Florida loses one of those first two games like they did last year, this, this time around, I think it's they're not screwed. Yeah, yeah. Like if Florida is going to win a regional this year, they have got to start two and oh, they don't have the pitching depth. Yeah. Well, and you can look at it two ways, right? Like, okay. So obviously Florida lost a ton of talent. Uh, from you know that that runner-up season last year, but then you could also be LSU, and LSU was in a hole, um, you know. And obviously they lost a ton from from last year's team too. But uh, you know it could always be worse. But yeah, certainly very very strange to see four to start you know top five again, and then it almost seems like they're underperforming again. And 
you know, look, man, we, it, it happened all last year too, where Florida had to come back. I mean, how many comeback wins did they have last year? I mean, going you know, from the SEC tournament, the NCAA, I mean, just like time and time and time and time again, and they were able to win and win and win somehow miraculously, you know, coming out of the loser's bracket in Gainesville. How in the world does that happen? Um, but again, it was the pitching, right? Like the, the pitchers stepped up when it mattered most, they had the depth and this year it just doesn't seem like they've got it. Um, I will say Saturday, you know, I, I was very surprised that Florida didn't win that game. It seemed, I mean, you were there. It seemed like Florida was going to win that game. Uh, and then all the momentum kind of came crashing down there uh, in the, what the, the, uh, the bottom of the eighth, eighth uh, the yeah. seemed like a very uh, <laughs> abrupt ending. But again, that just goes to show you can't rely on comebacks every time. Right. Right. And Florida, Florida has come back a lot this year. You mentioned last year, which they did. But this year, too, they had to rely on a lot of comebacks so they didn't have the great pitching at the start. Well, every SEC that. series win, right, this year has been yep. by way of a comeback. Um, you know, at least one of- at least one game in every series. I think maybe one of the A&M, I can't remember offhand, but maybe one of the A&M, A&M games, they were ahead from start to finish. Yeah. But pretty much every SEC win was a comeback, and you just yeah. you can't count on that in the postseason. Right. Well, and, you know, especially, you know, you mentioned Jack and, you know, I dare to say he's probably the greatest Gator baseball player that I, I've certainly seen in my lifetime. Just mm-hmm. I don't think that's, you know, a, a hyperbole just because he can do it all. I mean, he's he's a left he's a left handed pitcher, which is incredible in itself. And then his bat, I mean, he hit one to, you know, freaking Valdosta the other night. And, you know, it's just the, the amount that he can do. And, and it does feel like this team is going to waste his last season. Uh, and it's very sad because he is certainly the, the greatest Gator baseball player I've ever had the privilege to watch. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a sad thing, man. And I also, you know, this is kind of an interesting point. I, I, I do wonder too, you know, at the end of it, you know, how much, I know he's in incredible shape, right? They, all of those guys are, but you know, how much does fatigue play a factor right at the end of a season where you're doing everything, what, you know, with Jack, you know, and, and that may be what we're starting to see in some of his, you know, outings on Sundays. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much of a factor that is. I, I didn't grow up playing baseball, so I'm not really sure, but I imagine that, you know, by the time you get to April, if you're starting every single weekend uh, in, you know, the rotation and then, you know, you're you're also, you know, being used for your bat, like, you know, some fatigue's probably going to set in. Um, so I don't know, man, I, I, I hope they can get it together. Uh, but, you know, maybe er- an early exit in the SEC tournament is a good thing, you know, get them some rest and then, you know, kind of uh, gear up to go play wherever you're going to go. Um, you it's know, not going to be in games at all. It's yeah. not. No, yeah. no, not at this point. It can't be right. I mean, uh, I mean, what do they have for? Well, I guess that uh, honestly, Neil, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I know this is crazy, but like their schedule does allow if they win, right. If they win all of those series, which they're not going to, but like, if they do, you know, when you look at these last four series, obviously, you know, it's just a, a beast of a schedule. If they wind up taking three out of four series, there's a way that they played themselves back into the top 16, right? Well, I mean, they're, they're, so there are five series left. So even more time yeah. uh, plus the SEC tournament. So they, they still have six weeks to potentially make a good impression, but I mean, they could, we, we've seen that Florida does have the best series win of any team in the country right now over Texas A&M. Nobody yeah. else can claim that. And Florida also does have two series wins over RPI top 50 teams in LSU and Mississippi state still another win in a series over RPI number 65, Miami. So that's a pretty good resume for a team. That's only two games over 500. Yeah, um, sure. I think the, I think the Gators have to win all five remaining series, or maybe they can afford to lose one, two out of three. You can't get swept. Um, t- like typically, so yeah, like historically speaking, 20 and 10 in the SEC guarantees you a top eight seed. 19, 11 probably does it. It guarantees you a top 16 seed. Nine, uh, 18 and 12, you're kind of on that border. It depends what the rest of the field does for that top eight. 
but it guarantees you a top 16 seed. 17 and 13 is where it gets tricky. Like that's where you got to hope that there are a lot of other teams that just win their conferences, like running away with it. And there's no one else who finishes like second or third place in the power leagues, like the SEC or the ACC um, with, you know, 22, 23 wins. And you're kind of sitting and hoping and waiting and for selection Monday, I think it is, uh, to see where your name gets called. So Florida, I don't think is going to hit 20, obviously. They already have uh, eight losses. They're not going to go with 13 and two in the last five. So I think more realistic is to say, okay, get 10 more SEC wins and try to get 11. So you get that 17 and 13 record. And then it just becomes a question of how much does the committee value those midweek games? Because Florida has been horrible in them this year. And you lose one or two of them, it doesn't really do any damage. Like FSU got clobbered by Mercer, but who cares? That was one. Now, if you had that, and then you had like five other losses to like Jacksonville, another one to Mercer, UNF, USF, and UCF, well, then it becomes a problem. But that's Florida's problem right now. So they're going to have to get to that 16, 17 game benchmark for SEC wins and then just hope. Yeah, no, I, I mean, for sure. And then if, uh, you know, hopefully the baseball gods are obviously on their side, but it's been very surprising, man, for a team that seems like it has so much firepower, you know, to see them struggling offensively at times, is, it's just, and it, and they're very hot and cold. Um, you know, I don't quite understand it. But again, I never played baseball. So, you know, I, I don't know, you know, how, how these things work, but it is very surprising to me that, you know, a team that does just have, you know, so many good bats, just outright struggle. Um, you know, like the Florida state loss, you know, what was that last week or two weeks ago? Whenever that Which was. one? Like, well, right. But the last one. Yeah. Uh, 19 to four uh, one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're just sitting there like, okay, yeah, pitching is obviously an issue. Like, this is awful. But, you know, maybe maybe even more surprising was just the fact that there was just no run support at all. Uh, and I know that Florida is not going to put up 19 runs in that game, you know, to, to tie the freaking game. But, you know, like at the end of the day, what was it, four runs? Four? Yeah. He I started mean, up 2 nothing too, with the back-to-back homers, right, and right. then virtually nothing the rest of the way doesn't make sense it really doesn't um you know but you know again like you, you got to trust solely and i don't think anybody's obviously you know doubting what he's able to do but uh you know it does it's interesting man when you start looking at some of the recruiting classes right like tennessee's up there for i think this year next year um you know and florida was still in the top 10 but it's not what we saw what three years ago when Florida had that number one recruiting class. Um, and so, you know, you kind of wonder like, uh, you know, are, are Florida's glory days behind them? I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure, but you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's very, very weird how this season has played out and you, know, you start in the top five and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you don't even look like a top 30 team. And it doesn't like where you are in the postseason doesn't really guarantee you anything. I mean, we saw Florida lose a game in its regional last year, but I did some research on this and going back to 2016, every single college world series that's been contested since then, meaning obviously not 2020, but every single season that there was a tournament held two of the eight teams to make it to Omaha did not host a regional, did not host a super regional. So it, it can be done like Florida would not be breaking some kind of historical precedent by going to someone else's regional and winning it as the road team and then winning a road super regional. It's happened before it happens every year. So with Clemson. Right. With after, Clemson, after Tennessee was the host as the number one overall team and lost Notre Dame in its own super. So like right. it can happen. It's not like all is lost for Gator baseball. We're just saying they better figure something out quickly. Yeah, no, I mean, a hundred percent. And you know, they, they got to get some pitchers back. Um, you know, and, and, and really just find out where these guys are mentally, because uh, I, I don't, you know, sometimes I just don't think they're there. And I, I think I texted you the other night, obviously this was a, kind of a, kind of a joke, but you know, when Florida state, you know, was, I mean, just that, that one inning, was it the second, was it the second inning 
uh, where they, I don't even remember how, how many they scored at this point. I mean, it's, I kind of burned it out of my memory, but I, you know, I texted you, I'm like, maybe they have Florida signs. Like, it just seemed like, dude, every say, I'm not saying they did, by the way, I'm just saying like it, th- that's how bad Florida's pitching staff has been. Or it's just like, I'm sitting there just, I'm thinking to myself, like, I, I'm pretty sure I could figure out some of what Florida's pitching right now. And you know, that's not good. So I don't know if it's changing up signs. I have no idea. I'm not a big baseball guy. Like I said, I've never played, but um, you know, it, it does. It's just really interesting to me that, you know, a Florida pitching staff can just look so incredibly horrendous. Um, like you don't see that very often with Florida. Uh, that doesn't happen. And no. you know, here, here we go. Both in terms of inaccuracy, like walking and hitting guys and in terms of just, throwing meatballs where you miss yeah. your spots and they get clobbered. Right. I, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a team in my life in college baseball, at least not like at this level, bat around in the first inning without a single out being. Removed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you actually, I think you tweeted that the, the odds of that, the percentages are what, like 0.04%. It's insane. Um, which to be and, fair, what that was going off of MLB data because my dad's friend is like a big MLB advanced stat search, but all right, still, you can't imagine it's going to be that drastically different in college. Yeah. Uh, well, Florida, uh, a chance to obviously write the ship at Vanderbilt this weekend, uh, really big series. Maybe you start to get something going and who knows, man. I mean, like, I think you have all, I, I know that, that fans will probably laugh at this, but you know, taking one from South Carolina might be a really big thing when we look back at this season um you know sometimes that's what it takes you know to start getting things going you know start to feel good about yourself um i think getting swept by usc would have been you know pretty although they did it last year so but two sweeps in a row yeah it's not a rule but i i do think winning that game maybe provides a little bit of uh you know some some positivity anyway uh something that was much much needed after a six game losing streak uh basketball news sam alexis a big forward from chattanooga really big really really big pickup for todd golden uh you gotta love what this guy mm-hmm. does deal uh he's he's a big that loves to offensive rebound he can shoot the ball really well from two obviously golden's boys are, are very analytical in what they do and you know, his, his two point shooting is, is really off the charts. It's he makes a very uh, high percentage of his twos, which is exactly what Florida is looking for right now. Uh, six, nine, 230 pounds, uh, you know, just one of four players in all D one last year to average at least 10 points, nine boards, two blocks and shoot 55%. So not bad. Yeah. I mean, a big pickup Florida was going to have to get someone anyway to replace Tyree Samuel, even without talking about the health of Micah Hanlogton, who, by the way, I, I met him on um, Saturday at the spring game. He looks okay. Yeah. He seems like he's going to be back for the season. If he's not, he'll miss maybe a couple weeks or so. He'll be back for the brunt of the SEC schedule for sure. Barring, I mean, obviously barring a setback between now and then, but he, he should be fine. But anyway, Florida needed someone to replace Tyree Samuel. And this guy seems like... <clears throat> Maybe not quite as as girthy. Maybe in some ways he's a little bit bigger. Like he's he's definitely taller. But it seems like Florida definitely upgraded from what was already, I think, a strength. Tyree Samuel very good for Florida yeah. last year. I think Florida got someone even better in Sam Alexis. Obviously, um, the the shooting aspect of it is an upgrade. Tyree Samuel. You know, for all he could do well, he wasn't a great free throw shooter. He couldn't really turn around and hit jump shots. He I mean, there's no reason for defenders to respect that. He had to kind of back them down and get a baby hook or something in the paint. Alexis can shoot those from a little bit further away. He doesn't have like three range, but he can shoot in the mid-range jumper and get Florida some points that way. So that was a big get for Florida. I think that Golden is still going to be looking to take a couple more pieces, but that's a great start to the to the portal season for hashtag portal god Todd. Yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, look, there were a ton of other programs that were going after him, including georgia's mike white uh so that was a big get you know florida beats uh, mike white again uh so that's kind of nice and you know remember in in 06 and 07 uh guys like joe kim noah al horford right like 
they were they were great two point shooters, right? If you're a good shooter, that's a that's obviously a great sign because what you can do, and we're seeing it in the all over the NBA. You know, Billy had those guys start shooting threes, and guess what? A lot of them started going in, and that's tough to guard. So who knows? You know, if if he's a, a pure shooter, you know, from inside the arc, maybe he can extend that range a little bit, and and then Ford will be really fun to watch that, that would be i, ju- I mean I, I just like watch al horford shoot threes with the celtics and i'm always like flabbergasted like how yeah. how can a big guy shoot threes that well and obviously sam alexis is not al horford but the idea that you can have a guy who's good at just backing opponents down in the paint and then yeah. just turning around for a quick baby hook the, the, the idea that that guy can also like pull up and shoot elbow jumpers like oh okay that's that's a weapon. That's a real weapon that Florida can use throughout the course of the season. Yeah, no, for sure, man. And uh, hopefully we can get uh, my boy Patrick Young on here to to talk some hoops too at some point. Love it. That'd be you got you got the connections. It's part of why yeah. I got you you got those contacts. Although I do know Patrick too. That would be that would be an awesome that'd be an awesome guest. We can look forward to having him. Yeah, man. Uh, Neil, thank you very much. Uh, this was awesome, and uh, you know we'll. Obviously, we'll do it again. We'll do it again soon. Uh, next week, sometime, I guess. Um, you, you're you're kind of the master of the the schedules here. I'm I'm just kind of doing what I what I'm told to do. So, uh, so I'm kind well, of next following. next week. Next week will be a little difficult just because I have uh, Passover. I'm going back home to New Jersey, so I'll be at my parents, and we're having seder's. So I don't know how or when we'll get something out there, but we'll definitely keep getting content out with you. I mean, you're, you're obviously well-versed in your sports and I'm very happy to have you on board. So y'all you'll, you'll be hearing and seeing more of Mike Gillespie moving forward. So Mike, uh, welcome. And thanks for being a part of it. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, giving me something to do while I'm unemployed too. This is, uh, oh, this that's is- always a plus. Exactly. Thanks, man.